Hello and welcome. You're watching another edition of uh, Captains of Industry. Today's guest is a different captain. He's a marketer. He's a hotelier. In fact, you can't say his name without saying marketing and hotels. He's Chris Hartley, CEO of the Global Hotel Alliance, an 18-year-old association that says it enables independent, privately owned hotel labels to compete against the big boys, the big brands that have dominated the industry for decades. Chris, welcome. I wanted to start thank by you. I thank you. I wanted to start by asking you if COVID has changed the nature of the hotel industry as we know it, and also if Airbnb has had an impact. Wow. Well, there's two big questions there, um, and I'll probably tackle them separately. Um, let's start with COVID because um, I. I hate to think it sometimes, but I'm probably an industry veteran now. I've been working in the hotel industry for 30 years, and it's safe to say in my career, we've never experienced like anything close to what we've experienced over the last couple of years with COVID. I mean, just to give you a few uh, statistics to put that into context, um, and, and you barely uh, start to imagine what um, you would have thought if someone had told you this two years ago, but um, we've been down for a large chunk of the pandemic, uh, as much as 75% in revenue. Um, certain segments like international business travel have been down as much as 95%. And so um, we're talking about an industry that's been completely devastated. Many hotels across our uh, portfolio of currently over 500 hotels have been closed uh, for much of that time. Many countries have restricted travel to the extent that international visiting was impossible. And so we're really looking at an industry that has been on its knees for a large chunk of the last two years. And as it emerges from COVID, uh, we're starting to see that already. The first quarter of the year has been, relatively speaking, pretty strong. Um, we are looking at uh, a completely new picture, I think, for the industry, and one that will have uh, never again, I don't believe, um, reflect what we experienced uh, as one of our best years ever back in 2019. Before, that probably yeah. just touches on the COVID question, Airbnb and, and what they've been doing in the meantime is, is probably uh, a longer answer, but uh, let me pause there for a second. No, absolutely. Uh, and we'll come back to, to, to the Airbnb question. So I wanted to follow up a little bit on uh, the impact that we have seen from COVID on the hotel industry. Before we talk about uh, the industry uh, uh, sector that you particularly uh, represented, the independent side of it, are we seeing this change and this change potentially that we should be seeing? Is that for the better or do you think it could, uh, we could well be talking here about an industry that is being threatened in terms of uh, the service that it has traditionally provided? Yeah, I think um, you have to sort of look at that from different perspectives. Of course, the hospitality industry itself has been under threat uh, and remains in a critical condition. Um, at the moment, um, but there are signs of life. And um, we're emerging from this pandemic really with uh, uh, a whole load of very um, different problems to deal with than, than ever we would have thought we had to deal with before. For example, I'll, I'll throw a couple, of out, a couple of them out there for you. And the first one is um, we've, we've got to retrain and re-motivate um, our staff uh, like they've started afresh because for a lot of people, um, the COVID pandemic meant uh, in hotels that they, they lost their jobs. And in, in some cases, um, they've chosen not co to come back to the industry. And that means we are starting again to a certain extent in terms of bringing new people into hotels and attracting new people to hospitality. And that's proving more difficult than was expected um, in many uh, locations around the world, finding good people and persuading to join the hospitality industry is proving a bit of a challenge post pandemic. So on the one side, we're seeing a resurgence in demand, um, uh, but on the other side, we're struggling in some cases to service that demand. Um, so that, that's one new problem that we're facing. Another new problem we're facing is that the COVID pandemic has changed fundamentally business travel, and I believe uh, forever. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, depending on what your perspective is. Mm. A lot of companies have used the opportunity 
to fundamentally restructure their business travel uh, uh, rules, if you like, um, in terms of what they allow employees to do. Um, partly because there were health risks during the pandemic. Uh, that goes without saying. There were travel restrictions. There were insurance problems. Um, but also there has been a fundamental uh, acceleration in companies' view about the sustainability uh, plans and the view that companies have taken that flying employees around the world, especially international business travel, is something that should not be taken as lightly as it perhaps it has been previously. So companies are fundamentally reviewing their policies in terms of sustainability. And I think that will change the uh, way in which people uh, choose business travel, physical business travel, as opposed to what we're doing now, which is talking virtually, which of course is something that the pandemic has taught everyone to do. So those are just two examples of problems um, that we're experiencing emerging from the pandemic. Um, one, if you like, is, is bringing talent into the industry um, that has left uh, because of the situation hospitality faced for the last couple of years, attracting people back. Uh, and then there is the fundamental change in, in, in the demand side for our business, which is um, the, the, the loss of international business travel and the question mark over whether that's going to recover. And if it's not going to recover, what is going to replace it? I can tell you that uh, I've been one of the victims of uh, this new uh, uh, dynamic that we have in terms of uh, conducting interviews because I'd rather be in Dubai than be sitting in our offices here in uh, Johannesburg. But I'll allow you to talk a little bit uh, to your book and talk about the impact of our uh, Airbnb on the hotel industry. When it came in, some people suggested that uh, uh, this could be a really big threat. Looking back, has it been as bad as some predicted? I think... Airbnb is a sign of the changing travel sector and the way in which people are traveling differently. Um, and that's not just about the pandemic, because, of course, Airbnb was well on its way to successful growth uh, pre-pandemic. I think what the pandemic has done, as I was touching on earlier, has changed fundamentally the balance of power between leisure travel and business travel. And the reason people travel today uh, is, is very different. Um, at the moment, uh, post-pandemic, people are very much looking to reunite with families, uh, to take breaks that they haven't been able to take for the last couple of years. And to a large extent, people are seeking space. Uh, people are seeking the security, perhaps the, the sense of freedom that uh, using uh, a, a house or, or residence versus staying in a hotel may, may give you. So, on the face of it, you could say, uh, is Airbnb going to be a fundamental threat to the hotel business? No, I, I don't think so as such. It, it's more a reflection of the different type of leisure travel that people are seeking. Mm -hmm. And I think it reflects the growing demand for, for leisure travel that we're seeing across the whole globe. And especially we see that demand getting very quickly back to 2019 levels and beyond as soon as travel restrictions are lifted across all countries. And so we see Airbnb to a certain extent fitting into the new uh, leisure travel model of the future where leisure travel will overtake uh, business travel um, in terms of demand. And of course, people seek all sorts of different types of leisure experiences. We on the independent side cater for a very different type of leisure experience than for example, the, the big box brands do. And so I think what you're seeing Airbnb represents an evolution of, of people's needs when it comes to leisure travel, traveling with families in bigger groups, wanting more space. Um, and of course, the disruptive model that it represents of allowing people to rent out their own homes, yeah. um, which in the same way Uber did. So uh, with, with, with the taxi industry. So I, I think it's a sign of the times. We have to adapt. A lot of hotel yeah. companies are starting to offer residence products and things and and um, so I think uh, it, it, it's, it's all about adapting to that change and Airbnb forces us to rethink a little bit. Yeah, it sounds to me like you're saying the two can coexist. I think they, they will coexist very successfully and uh, they may even overlap. I think Airbnb may choose to offer hotel products. Um, to a certain extent, they do. Um, they bought uh, an online travel agency called Hotel Tonight and they've started themselves to 
to offer alternative hotel products to their own um, re more, more residential offering. And so I, I, I think we will coexist and uh, that's, that's the way business works. Someone disrupts and then everyone else adapts to that disruption. Yeah, I want to take one more question around uh, COVID. And uh, the issue I wanted to explore is uh, the uh, impact and uh, the relationship between the independents and the big brands. Has that changed uh, because of COVID? Again, I, I would say the, the big change that we expect and, and we certainly hope, um, especially for us uh, in, in our alliance representing the independent sector, is that the growth in leisure travel means that your biggest customer base and your highest spending customer base is starting to look for different experiences. That's what leisure travel is all about. If you go back 30 or 40 years, the success of business travel um, and business travel hotels was that people, when they traveled far away from home on business and their companies wanted to make so sure that they were very secure and, and were welcomed in an environment where they felt at home. And so the advent of the big brands was all about standardization, security, providing a reliable and safe product for customers as they started to explore the world as business travelers. And that reflected what companies wanted their employees um, to experience, um, that feeling of security, um, safety, and ultimately the ability to negotiate with big brands in terms of pricing, et cetera. If you look at leisure travel, it's very different. People actually do not want to have a standardized experience as they travel around the world. They want different experiences. And so I think the independent sector represents something that leisure travelers of the future will be looking for. When you travel to India, of course, you could stay in another Marriott. There are plenty of them there or another Hilton. But I think, and I give the example of our brand in India, uh, Leela represents a, a very unique local Indian brand, which very much reflects the, the culture of the country in, in great resorts and, and cities around um, around India. And I think if we can help brands like that to um, reach uh, a, a, leisure trust, a leisure customer base uh, and, and create awareness for those brands, then I, I think leisure travelers are going to be looking for that sort of experience. And the same is true. We recently signed uh, Sun International in South Africa. They, they joined the alliance at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. and, and Sun International is, is another example of a great African brand, fantastic products. Yeah. And uh, of course, there are the Marriott's and everything down in South Africa. But but for, for customers to be able to come to that market as it reopens and, and, and choose a local brand, I, I think is something that in particular the leisure market is looking for. Yeah, I wanted to explore that one because I found it curious that you've got Sun International, which is a big hotel brand uh, here in South Africa, joining your association, which, as you say yourselves, you are independent, privately owned hotel brands that compete against the largest uh, hotel brands in the world. That's right. Well, I, I think everything's relative. And um, yes, Sun International is a big brand uh, in South Africa, um, we, we have a number of big brands uh, um, who are of similar size in their own markets. I think it's all about competition. You know, within South Africa, in that domestic market, of course, Sun International has a stellar reputation and is probably the brand or one of the brands that uh, most locals would recognize when it comes to upscale and luxury hotels in South Africa. But South Africa is also a market that receives millions or at least pre-COVID, millions of international tourists every year. And to penetrate that international market for a relatively small brand on the scale of a Marriott or a Hilton globally is extremely expensive to do on your own. And so by being part of an alliance network, uh, and I would compare what we're doing with Global Hotel Alliance at this point to, for example, what Star Alliance did in the pioneers of airline alliances, South African Airways being part of Star Alliance gives you um, the reach and the network to be able to put your brand in front of more customers globally, which is so important in, in terms of uh, maintaining or gaining market share of international customers who are offering the premium segments of customer that uh, brands are, are really keen to reach. 
uh, in, in order to drive their own profitability and not just rely on domestic business and domestic awareness. Yeah, and now that we're talking about Sunny International, I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about the outlook for Southern Africa. You're sitting in Dubai, and we know that uh, pre-COVID, Emirates, of course, was the big boy in terms of connecting those two hubs. I wanted to know the outlook from your perspective, from your customers, from the numbers that you look at, how Southern Africa stacks up uh, when you compare against other parts of the world, and in terms of growing your own membership within our region. Yeah, well, part of... Um what we want to achieve is a global presence. Of course, Africa is a very diverse market, both in terms of business travel and uh, leisure travel. And uh, if you look at the different markets in Africa, they've also got very different feeds. And so part of what we're trying to achieve with the Alliance is, is on the one side, um, offer choice to our customers. So today we have um, in the Alliance 56 hotels in Africa, the African continent. Um, that rep, uh, th those hotels are represented by 10 different brands. We mentioned Sun International. We've got brands like uh, Anantara, uh, Avani. We have uh, Kempinski. We have, uh, uh, what other brands can I think of? JA Resorts, for example, in the Seychelles. And Elawana, of course, which is a significant uh, safari brand that is also owned by the Miner Group. And... So what we're trying to do is create a brand presence and hotel presence in Africa that gives choice to our customers. Mm -hmm. Today, we have around 150,000 uh, of our GHA Discovery members. GHA Discovery is our loyalty platform, which we use to try to compete with the likes of Hilton Honors and Marriott Bonvoy. So mm -hmm. we have about 150,000 members in Africa, but we have 20 million members around the world. <laughs> so our goal is trying to channel those members two destinations around the world from, from as I said earlier, um, from international markets. Now, of course, to achieve that, we need airline lift. Uh, Emirates, uh, this uh, Dubai hub here where I'm sitting, has been a huge uh, uh, hub for driving traffic into the African continent. And of course, a lot of customers that we're bringing internationally into Africa are using Dubai as a hub. And so Emirates becomes critical in terms of airlift, so partnerships with uh, tour operators that are using and working with Emirates and, and other Middle Eastern brands, actually, like Etihad and Qatar, uh, are very important to provide that lift into African destinations, which may not be um, served directly from some of our feeder markets, for example, in Europe. Yeah. When I started the program, I referred to the fact that uh, when we talk about you, you have to say marketing, you also have to say hotelier. And uh, was, that, was that your choice? Was it just you deciding this is what you wanted to do? Or uh, was there some light bulb moment uh, that took place in your life and you decided you're a marketer and you're going to be in the hotel industry? Uh, not really. It was one of those strange things. I actually studied languages uh, as a student and uh, I had a a father who's very eager for me to find a career of any description, I think, just to get me <laughs> off his books. And uh, he said, listen, if you're going to study languages, you're either going to become a teacher, he says, and that's not particularly lucrative, or you can join the airline industry, but your cousin's already joined British Airways, so that's probably not a good idea to copy him. Um, or this is the hotel industry. And uh, so for want of a better idea, I said, well, what about the hotel industry? Uh, there was a great big uh, family owned brand, um, which had become a public company sub subsequently in the UK called Trust Us Forte at the time. And I uh, decided to join their graduate program. And that, as they say, is that that was 30 plus years ago at the end of the 1980s. And uh, I've stayed in the industry ever since and uh, have never looked back and never regretted it. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the GHA, I mean, it's an interesting uh, uh, organization that you, uh, you guys are uh, built up there. When I was reading through, I saw you guys say this was set up uh, in 2004. No, no. Uh, since 2006 was the formal launch, uh, you started thinking about it in 2004. What was the impetus for the creation of that organization? That's a, a good question. Well, I, I touched on the beginning of my career back at the end of the 1980s, and I subsequently had a very uh, enjoyable and interesting journey through different uh, cities around the world, ending up uh, working for uh, a wonderful brand called Kempinski, 
Uh, Kempinski at the time was a German brand owned by Lufthansa. And we had the benefit, as a, especially myself as a young marketeer, of having all the support of Lufthansa as a global airline, helping us to sell and distribute our hotels around the world. They sold Kempinski uh, at the time that many of the airlines were selling hotel assets that they'd built up over the years. Uh, Pan Am owned Intercontinental Air France owned Meridian, for example. So there we were, Kempinski is a relatively small brand sold off by our giant airline uh, owner. And um, we really wondered what to do next. And I was one of the pioneers behind getting uh, a few like-minded independent hotel groups together and saying, why don't we create something like Star Alliance? And Lufthansa had at that time gone off and created Star Alliance with uh, uh, several other airlines. And this was very much a model that we aspired to. We felt the independent sector needed some sort of collaborative platform in order to be able to survive in a world where the, the big brands were already getting bigger. And so that's how the concept, if you like, of the alliance was born back in originally 2004, and then we became uh, a fully fledged company in 2006. Yeah, we have to talk, of course, about the outlook of uh, your association. I see here you talk about adding another 360 hotels uh, in uh, 20, uh, 20. No, this is NH, right? This is NH, sorry, sorry. That's uh, right. NH Hotel Group will add uh, a further 360 hotels when it joins the alliance in 2022. How many are you expecting in 2022? And uh, perhaps let's talk about the outlook just in terms of uh, growing your own association into the future. Yes, well... We're optimistic. Uh, the last two years have been very turbulent. I talked about the trauma of uh, mm. COVID and the pandemic for the hospitality industry. Revenues down 75%. Um, you couldn't have made that up two years ago. But here we are now looking at a strong recovery. Q1 is uh, ending with probably our best Q1 uh, of recent history, uh, even arguably in terms of the rate the sort of rates and demand uh, we're generating at the moment better than we were back in 2019 not on a broad uh, broadly based level i think we need more markets to open up uh, but we we do anticipate uh, by the end of this year that on a on a broad base we will be back to about 80 to 90 percent of 2019 revenues we Gained some brands. I talked about Sun International. We lost some brands over the last two years uh, who decided to do other things. But the biggest coup for us was uh, the signature of NH Hotels, uh, a Spanish group. They are uh, represented really on a global basis, but their, their strength is really in, in Europe, in Spain, uh, their home market, Germany, Italy, Benelux, and a very strong presence in South America, where until now we haven't had many hotels. So 360 plus hotels will be joining the Alliance on the 1st of June, which is very exciting. And we have several other brands that we're talking to at the moment. And we're hoping that we'll continue to grow over the next uh, couple of years. And our, real, our, our aim really is to get to around a thousand hotels, possibly up to 50 brands mm -hmm. by 2025 or so. Yeah, I'm hoping that uh, in uh, those uh, new members that you are adding, there will be many more that will be uh, coming from uh, the African continent that you can expand uh, the number of countries that you have visited on the African continent in addition uh, to those uh, very luxurious places uh, that you have been to. Before you go, I wanted to touch again a little bit on uh, the leisure and uh, business travel. And you have referred to it uh, throughout our conversation. But I wanted to focus on the outlook for that. Are we likely to see both growing at the, set, at the same pace or is one uh, set to outgrow the other? My guess would be uh, leisure getting bigger than business, given the consciousness of companies around uh, carbon emissions, reducing costs, etc. That's what we expect. We, we, I joke sometimes that business travel on an airplane will be leisure travelers. And I seriously expect that over the next three or four years, we're going to see leisure, traveler, leisure travel, both in terms of rates, uh, price, and demand, uh, overall demand exceeding uh, business travel for many of our hotels. Um, even on a global basis, in, in, in many urban locations, we expect, uh, in many cases, leisure travel to exceed uh, business. So 
that's something uh, we have to adapt to and we have to retarget our marketing efforts accordingly and become more of a leisure focused organization. Our rewards program, our, uh, our rewards currency that we've created called Discovery Dollars is all about encouraging people to try more of our brands, try more of our hotels. And it's very much focused on a repeat leisure traveler. So what we want people to do is come and try some of our brands, feel what it's like to experience uh, an independent-minded uh, organization like ours, and then repeat um, by encouraging them to stay loyal to the sort of brands we represent with a strong loyalty platform and also a reach across different parts of the world where we need to build relationships with the travel sector, with the travel industry, so that we also are able to put our brands in front of more people in markets. I talked about uh, South Africa, South America, um, where there are outbound travelers, people who want to travel internationally on leisure. And we, we need to have our products in front of those people. And that's what the Alliance is helping to enable um, for our member brands. So yes, leisure travel will be taking the lead. Business travel will take a long time to recover and will be very, very different when it does. And I think uh, the hotel sector is already adapting to that, both in terms of its product, and you'll see also developments of new hotels will be very much focus on resorts uh, uh, ahead of urban locations. We'll leave it on that uh, optimistic uh, note uh, from uh, Chris. Chris, uh, the hotelier, uh, Chris, uh, the marketer, the CEO of uh, the Global Hotel Alliance. Thanks very much indeed for watching this edition of uh, Captains of Industry. Until next time, goodbye.